Okay, folks, welcome back to another entry in my series on my most outrageous and interesting twisty puzzles. Um, previously, we've talked about the giant Rubik's Cubes, the giant dodecahedrons, which are hidden behind this guy, and most recently, Aton Star, a deep cut face turning icosahedron. I'm keeping Aton Star out for a moment because, in order to understand our next puzzle, which is the Tutminx, um, it's helpful to look at the icosahedron for a moment. So, the icosahedron obviously has 20 sides. However, let's imagine that we took the shape, which has 12 corners, right? And we took a knife and we lopped off each of the 12 corners and flattened it out. So essentially we've created another face on each of those corners, right? Now, because if you look at each corner on a icosahedron, uh, each corner is bordering five sides. So when I chop it off or truncate it, I end up with an additional face that is five-sided, a pentagon. And so on top of the 20 faces that were already there, I would then have 12 new faces, which would all be pentagonal, giving me 32 faces, 12 pentagons, 20 hexagons, right? And that's exactly what the Tutminx is. It's a truncated icosahedron, as you can see here. Um, and we have 12 pentagonal faces, which correspond to those truncated corners of the icosahedron, and then we have 20 hexagons, which are now the kind of reshaped leftover faces from the icosahedron. Um, and this aspect is key to the uniqueness of the Tutminx. So um, unlike all the puzzles you've seen so far in this series, uh, this puzzle has two distinct types of faces with different rules for how they turn, okay? So on the pentagonal faces, here's a nice yellow one here, uh, these faces can be turned to any of the five possible stops uh, where further turns are possible, and then I can do subsequent moves quite easily, right? So there's no real restrictions on the movement of the pentagons, but if I grab this orange hexagon here, and I just move it one step out of its six possible stops, none of the subsequent turns will work. And that's a side effect of the geometry of this puzzle and the mechanism that they use to make it. So if you look closely, um, when I move that face one stop, while it kind of looks like the puzzle should turn, actually the pieces are not fully matched up. There's a little bit of overhang here on the edge. Um, the, the pentagon, the, the hexagon edge that connects to um, this area here is not fully matched up with this pentagon edge. So if I were able to turn this and break this edge off the hexagon and start shuffling it around, um, that would lead to the puzzle eventually getting sort of distorted shape-wise as wrongly shaped pieces are in wrong positions, and eventually the puzzle would completely stop working. It would seize up. So on the Tutminx, you have to always bear in mind that the pentagons can move however you like, no problems there, but that the hexagons have to move in two steps at a time, right? So before I moved it one step, and that's a no-go. The puzzle tells me no. If I move it a second time, then everything is back to normal. I can move any of the adjoining faces without any, any issues at all. So this really interesting behavior of the two face types is what gives the Tutminx its unique character and unique way of solving. It also leads to some interesting characteristics of the way that the puzzle scrambles. Um, so this puzzle has, as I said, 32 faces, 12 are pentagonal, pentagonal faces, and 20 are hexagonal. Um, in total, you have 150 movable and scramblable pieces uh, compared to 20 on the standard Rubik's Cube. So there's a lot more work to do and also a lot more colors to go looking for. Um, one interesting aspect is that because of the way the puzzle turns, um, the corners actually only have one possible orientation. So on the Rubik's Cube, the, the corners can get twisted around, but that doesn't happen on the Tutminx. The corners will get shuffled, but they will be pointing the direction that they started in. Uh, they don't get turned over or twisted around. So that does help a bit with the solving. Um, also, the uh, non-pentagonal edges, right? So edges on the puzzle that are not connected to pentagons, um, the edges along those, uh, these edge pieces rather, they are not able to be flipped. So they also have one orientation. The hexagonal edge pieces, they can flip and have different orientations. And you know, remembering that on the dodecahedral puzzles, we have 
30 edge, edge pieces or 30 edges to deal with. On the top minx, we have 90. So there's a lot of edge and corner pairing to be done on this puzzle. Um, so because of these inter interesting aspects of the scramble and solve and the, the two different face types, it gives the puzzle a really unique feel. Um, when you try to accomplish what seems like a simple task, you sometimes have to sort of work out a path along the puzzle, um, which allows you to do legal turns and not get blocked up by the, the puzzle um, while still accomplishing what you need to do without re-scrambling too much stuff. So there's an interesting challenge to that. Um, and the sheer number of faces means there's a lot of interesting surprises in every scramble. Um, I've solved this now a couple of times. I've actually found it really enjoyable and, and surprisingly relaxing because although it does have these weird characteristics that are unlike the other puzzles that we've seen, and it does require you to manipulate and maneuver pieces around in a kind of unusual way, um, I found it really stimulating. And, uh, you know, although there's a lot of work to do on the puzzle, none of it felt tedious because there was a lot of variety and that was facilitated by these two different face types. It gives the puzzle a sense of lots of different things happening and each face you needed to solve is going to be a little bit different from the last one because even if it's, you know, uh, even if you're solving a, another pentagon and you just solved a pentagon, the state of the puzzle will have changed in that time and the allowable paths you could use to move pieces around subject to the rules of the Tupminx will have changed. So throughout the solve, however long it is, uh, I did feel that it was constantly giving me new things to think about. So for that reason, I really highly recommend this puzzle. Definitely, like the, the Mega Minx and the other dodecahedrons, you should be comfortable with F2L on the cubic puzzles first, because you need to do a lot of that, and there's so many edge pieces now with 90 of them that uh, solving them one by one without pairing them up to corners, I think would just that would start to feel tedious. But if you're comfortable with building edge piece and corner piece pairs, um, then there's a lot of fun stuff to do on this puzzle. This particular example, <coughs> excuse me, is called the Speed Tup Mix, and uh, the Tup Mix family in general is kind of a trademark of Very Puzzle. Very Puzzle has made the Tup Mix here and all of these large puzzles in the back, actually. Um, the Tup Mix is probably one of their more iconic releases, um, and they've made, I think, now five different versions of the Tup Mix, uh, each sort of progressively improving on the previous one or adding new elements. Um, right now, the Speed Tup Minx was pretty plentiful a couple months ago, but now maybe with Lockdown and Twisty Puzzlers being starved for more entertainment, um, they're starting to disappear off the market. So if you do see one, I would say grab it up. The main distinguishing point of the Speed Tup Minx is, first of all, the faces have this concave aspect, which helps with gripping the faces, um, because the puzzle has so many faces, it's almost like a ball. So having the corner sticking out like this helps with grip and so forth and it's also nice to to hold it feels very stable in your hand um, the other aspect is the uh, the mechanism actually blocks you from making illegal turns on the very first version of the tup minx i would be able to do things like you know move a, a hexagon one step and the puzzle would actually allow me to make a subsequent illegal move um, and that means that if you weren't paying attention on your own then you might end up with the, the puzzle getting really locked up and into a bad state and you'd have to disassemble it in order to, to fix it. Um, that's not the case on this puzzle because it simply won't allow you to do illegal turns. So that's really helpful, particularly for me. I'm, this is you know the first puzzle I got with multiple face types. So it was good to have the puzzle kind of very blatantly warning me not to do something. Um, they give you also another visual cue in that on the Speed Tut Minx, the stickers they send with the puzzle um, all the pentagonal faces have these carbon fiber textured stickers, which again gives you a visual reminder of which face type you're dealing with at any given time. Um, so in general, I, I really recommend this version of the Tup Minx, although uh, granted I don't have any of the other versions. Um, the current one, I think the only one that's available from Very Puzzled directly, is the Void Tup Minx. The Void Tup Minx is, uh, does not have this concave aspect, and in fact the big key element of that puzzle is that it's hollow. So none of the faces have centerpieces, so you can look through the puzzle. Um, and it doesn't have a core. It's completely hollow, and the pieces move on rails. Um, the first version of the Void Tup Mix apparently was a bit stiff, but now the new one turns very smoothly. And the hollow aspect of it and the lack of centerpieces adds another level of challenge as well, because um, on a normal type minx, just like on a, on the odd layered cubes or dodecahedrons, you have face centerpieces that don't move. 
So I always know that this face should be yellow, no matter how scrambled the puzzle is, because that yellow center will stay there. On the Voitup Minx, you don't have any centers to guide you, so you have to deduce where you need to build your faces up by looking at the colors on the corner pieces, essentially, and working out what faces have to be near other ones. So there's a bit of an additional puzzle element to it. However, I think for an experienced solver, that wouldn't make too much difference, because we're used to other puzzles where you need to remember your color scheme or, or do similar things. Um, but it is an attractive additional element. Um, the Speed Tup Minx uh, does not have that aspect, obviously. All the centers are in place. So um, in any case, if you find a Tup Minx, uh, I would grab it. It's a very unique puzzle. It's great fun to solve. This one I got at a bargain price of 33 bucks from Z Cube, and it was even more of a bargain because they sent me a second one for some reason. So I have two. Uh, and uh, it's great to have a backup, you know, in case piece breaks or I need to replace something or what have you um, and I can try maybe a different sticker scheme on the other one I'm not sure but uh, really it's a it's a really enjoyable puzzle the two face types are really fun and introduce new wrinkles to the solve the stickers are high quality the movement is good really it's it's one of my rapidly becoming one of my favorite puzzles um, one thing I should note as well is that kind of as a surprise to everyone because I don't think anybody suspected this but um, Last year, Very Puzzle released the Giga Tut Minx, or also known as the Ray Minx. So the Tut Minx is called the Tut Minx because it was invented by a man called Lee Tut back in 2005, and it took a while um, for it to be mass produced. Then uh, Ray Bruno uh, was another guy who really was fond of this puzzle and wanted to make a 5x5 version. So in this one, we have three pieces along each edge. The Giga Tut Minx has five, and uh, that leads to an explosion in the number of pieces you have to solve, obviously. Then you get from 150 to 722. Um, and it was sort of, you know, it was, he 3D printed it, and it was pretty exciting, but nobody really suspected it'd be mass-produced. And then it suddenly, very puzzled, released one. Costs about $100, and it's uh, still one of the largest twisty puzzles that's ever been made. It's about the same size as this guy in the back here, so about 20 centimeters in diameter. Very, very impressive to see. They did a great job with it, by all accounts. Um, and I think what I've seen anyway about it is that, you know, you can solve that puzzle by reduction, as you would on a larger cube or dodecahedron. So you reduce it to a normal tut minx and then do a tut minx solve. Um, but the, you know, the nature of the tut minx and the two face types means that pairing up the centers and edges on a tut minx is a bit more uh, difficult and intriguing than doing so on, say, a higher order cube. So um, I've also heard rumors that the Giga Tut Minx may not be made for much longer. So I am looking to grab one pretty soon. And I recommend if the look of a Tut Minx magnified significantly beyond even this craziness appeals to you, then I'd go uh, check out the Giga Tut Minx and see if it's for you because probably they're going to be difficult to find quite soon. So that's the Tut Minx. I've rambled on a bit about this one, but it really is a very, very good puzzle. That I highly recommend. Um, since there are a few different versions, if you see this video and you're curious which one to get, you've you found a few options, just let me know and I can give you um, you know all the info that I have about them, and hopefully you can make an informed decision. As I said, get comfortable with kind of intermediate three by three solving, and ideally do a bit of mega minx or other dodecahedral solving first, so you're kind of ready for this guy. But um, yeah, it's a great puzzle, challenging but not brutalizing. Um, and definitely a great one for the collection. So that's the Tut Minx built on the geometry of the truncated icosahedron. From here, we're moving on to even more unusual geometries. So I'll see you next time for that.